Friends, this Advent, uh, we're going to look at the Christmas story from the perspective of a prophet who wrote 600 years before the manger. You know, Isaiah is oftentimes called the Old Testament gospel because he talks about uh, the coming Messiah so often. But we're going to focus on just seven verses. Uh, from Isaiah chapter 9, uh, here's God's word uh, for us today. Uh, hear these ancient words that point to the manger, but also point to the hope that we have for the holidays. Ancient words that are able to transform lives today. Hear these words. It says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, uh, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have increased, enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. The, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, established and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that day on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Friends, this is the first Sunday of the month, and that means we have a new memory verse. Our memory verse for Advent comes from the text I just read, uh, probably the most familiar uh, verse of the, from uh, verse 6. Uh, so will you say this with me, and then we'll uh, pray. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. Well, will you pray with me? And so, Lord, Isaiah wrote 2,600 years ago. And yet, we believe that his words are living and speak to us today. And so, Lord, would you let his words... Speak to our hearts. Would you let uh, his words bring light into our darkness? God, would you come and just shatter the darkness? Let us know the hope of the holiday today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Darkness. There's something unsettling about darkness, isn't there? Seems like no matter how old we get, we never completely get over our fear of the dark. 
And, you know, really, we're not even in the dark right now. We can see the light of the exit signs. We can see the light coming in from the doors in the back. As your eyes get used to the darkness, you'll actually be able to see me standing up here. But could you imagine being in total darkness? Have you ever been in total darkness? I remember a time we were on vacation and we went on a cave trip and we went deep down into the earth and for a few moments they turned off the lights and it was total darkness. I mean, you couldn't see your hand if you put it right up on your nose. Could you imagine being lost in darkness? Can you imagine being lost in a cave with no light? Can you imagine groping along, hoping to find your way out, and, and coming to the place of, of despair and hopelessness? Again, in darkness, not knowing where you've been or where you're headed. And then, just as hopelessness sets in, you see a light, a faint light in the distance. And hope begins to kindle up within you. That's what the ancients were longing for. For ever since Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden, a spiritual darkness had come upon the land, and generation after generation after generation, walked in darkness. And just when it seemed like all was hopeless, a voice cries out in the darkness about a light that was to come and that someday a light would dawn on those in darkness. At first, that light was very faint. It was just a promise. Well, this morning, we light the Advent candle of hope and reminds us of that period of waiting. 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 And all they had was that light of hope. That someday the promise would come to fruition and the light would come. And when the time had fully come, the light came. It didn't come as they were expecting it. The light came in the form of a little baby lying in a manger. Friends, the hope of Christmas is that the light has come. And the light has come for wherever you find yourself in darkness today. Because the child that has been born to us, the son that has been given, said, I am the light, or I have come into the world as a light, so that those, so that no one should walk in darkness. And just like the lights just came on, that's what happened when Jesus came into the world. The light of the world was now among us. And Darkness was about to be shattered. You know, Isaiah wasn't the only one uh, who spoke of that darkness and the need for a light. Just a little bit before Jesus was born, Zechariah the priest uh, had a prophetic word about the one who was coming. And, and he said, uh, the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. 
just shortly before Jesus was born. That was the prophetic word. And then just after Jesus was born, remember the part of the Christmas story where Mary and Joseph bring baby Jesus to Jerusalem and this old man wants to come and hold the baby and he holds baby Jesus in his arms and, and Simeon the prophet looks down at that little baby and he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation. Can you imagine that? Looking into the eyes of baby Jesus. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared uh, in the sight of all people, a light of revelation for the Gentiles. And then after uh, Jesus was uh, crucified and resurrected, the apostle Paul, he looked back at Isaiah and maybe what Simeon had said and Zechariah, and he says, I'm saying nothing more than what the prophets and Moses had said would happen, that the Christ would suffer and, and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Did you catch that little thing that Simeon and, and Paul said? A light, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles? You know, a Gentile was anybody who wasn't a Jew. And, and uh, Isaiah uh, was making it clear in our text today that the Messiah would come to the Galilee of the Gentiles. That's where Jesus did most of his ministry. And that didn't set well with some of the Jews. They didn't like the fact that, that the light would come to Gentiles as well as Jews. But Isaiah made it clear, both in our text and even clearer in Isaiah 49, when he says, it is no small thing, or it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Friend, that's the hope of the holidays, that Christmas is for everybody. And that ought to make you very happy, because I suspect most of us here are Gentiles. And God is saying, the hope of Christmas is for you and for all who walk in darkness, that a light has come. And yet, even in Jesus' day, some rejected the light. I mean, can you imagine sitting here in darkness as we were a moment ago and choosing to stay in darkness rather than coming into the light? And yet, many did that. You know, John, when he writes his gospel, he talks about Jesus being the light, and he explains why some would reject the light. And we'll discover it's the same reasons people reject the light today. He said, first of all, they don't understand it. You know, he said, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. You know, that's partly because their eyes had grown accustomed to the dark. And they didn't understand this new thing that God was doing to bring restoration. And because they, he didn't come as they were expecting, they didn't recognize him. And so John goes on and he says, The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Uh, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Because they weren't expecting a baby coming in a being laid in a manger. They were expecting this mighty king to restore the kingdom to David. And so they didn't recognize him. And therefore, John goes on and says they didn't receive him. He says he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And then he explains the reason, the real reason why they didn't receive him was because they love darkness. You know, John said in John chapter 3, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. 
And, and John was simply saying, in Jesus' day, there were those who would choose to stay in darkness rather than come into the light. There would be those who would choose to enjoy the pleasures of sin in darkness rather than experience the joy of the light. And, and that wasn't unique to Jesus' day. Isaiah had actually said the same thing 600 years earlier. Just a little bit before our text in Isaiah 9, Isaiah was lamenting the people of his day. And he, was, he, he said, the woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Things haven't changed a whole lot, have they? Because aren't we living in a culture that does that? Aren't we living in a culture that says that which is good is evil and that which is evil is good and exchanging light for darkness? And aren't we in a culture that sometimes embraces darkness rather than the light? Isaiah said it would happen. Even though the light has come into the world, some people, even today, will reject the light. But the hope of Christmas is that we can be rescued by the light. We can be rescued by the light. I remember our text from uh, Colossians uh, a couple of months ago where he says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And he was simply saying, we live in the dominion of darkness in a very real sense. We are like prisoners of war. And, and that we live under the bondage of an enemy of darkness. And we don't normally think of Christmas like this, but Christmas is actually an act of war. Where light invades the darkness. And light comes to set free those who are under bondage to darkness. You know, that's why the Bible says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. That's why Jesus came. That, and what is the devil's work? Well, our text in Isaiah gives us a hint of it. What Midian was to the nation of Israel is what our enemy is to our spiritual lives. And in, in, in Israel's day, Midian became a yoke around their neck that oppressed them. It became like a bar across their shoulder, a rod uh, that oppressed them. And isn't that exactly what the enemy does today? Tries to keep us in darkness? And, and he uses a yoke or a bar or a rod. You know, just some. He convinces them that there is no God. He whispers in their ear, you know, that story about a virgin and a miracle birth and shepherds and angels, well, that's all fine and good for your sentimental holiday feelings, but, but there's really no historical reason to believe it. And he puts a bar of doubt across our back. For others, he comes and whispers to them, you're not good enough. You'll never be like the rest of those church people. And he places a yoke of rejection. You'll never be enough. And, and to others, he uses the rod of guilt. Whispering how terrible our sins are and, and that we have outdone God's forgiveness. That we've broken our promise to God so many times that there's no forgiveness left for you. And he puts a yoke of condemnation around our neck. You know, there are many other bars and rods he uses, whether it's fear or, or greed or, or pride or anxiety, uh, discouragement, despair. And all of these, he uses them to keep us in darkness, putting a yoke upon us of hopelessness and despair. And just like the ancients, uh, we, we long for a light to come to shatter the darkness. 
Because deep within us, we know this isn't what we were created for. I was not created to live under this bar of oppression, with this yoke of oppression. And that's the hope for the holiday. That's the good news of Christmas. Jesus has come to set you free. And he says there's a different yoke for you now. Remember Jesus? He says, come to me. All you are weary and burdened. It's as if to say, come to me, all you who've been trying to get along in the darkness. Come to me, all you that have felt the yoke of the enemy upon you, all those who feel the rod and the bar of the enemy. Come to me, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. It says, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. That is the hope of Christmas. We get to trade our yoke. And the yoke of oppression has been shattered. And Jesus now invites us to come because he says, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Friends, that's good news. But it gets even better. Because the good news isn't just that He delivers us from darkness. The good news is what He delivers us into. Because it's one thing just to take us out of darkness, but it's another thing to bring us into His kingdom. And that's what He does. Again, remember our text in Colossians? He's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of God light. For He's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. That's the real good news of Christmas, is that we get to enter into the very kingdom of God. We get to live in a new way. We get to live as, as followers of the King and notice Isaiah says there that he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom from that time on. What does that refer to? Well, it refers to the time that the child came. It says, for us to us, son is given, a child is born. And from that time on, he's going to be the king. And you know what that means? That means we can live in that kingdom now. It means we don't have to wait for some time in the future, but that our joy uh, in Christmas and in our lives is that we get to live in a new kingdom. And what that's, what's that kingdom like? The Bible is full of descriptions of that kingdom. In just those seven verses that I read, Isaiah gives us five descriptions of the kingdom. This is what it means to live out of the darkness and in the kingdom. He said it's a kingdom of freedom. He says he shattered the yoke. He's removed the bar. He's removed the rod. That means we can live in freedom. The Bible says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. We don't have to live in bondage anymore. That's the hope of Christmas. It's a kingdom of joy. It says, you have increased their joy. It says, they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. The kingdom is a place of joy. And God wants us to be, to be filled with joy. He said he wants the joy that was in Jesus to be in the church. And so our mouths can be filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. Because we're in a new kingdom now. We're not living in darkness anymore. And he said it's a kingdom of peace. He said he'll be called the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his uh, government and peace, 
there'll be no end. That's why every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood is destined for burning because his kingdom is a place of peace. And that means peace within ourselves and peace with one another. That's his kingdom. And he said it would be a kingdom of justice. You know, that he would uh, establish his kingdom and uphold it with justice. And, he says, with righteousness. It's a good place. I mean, honestly, friends, wouldn't you want to live in a kingdom that is filled with freedom, joy, peace, justice, and righteousness? And trust me, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what the Bible says about living in the kingdom. That's our identity because of Christmas. That's the hope that we have for the holidays. And to enter into that, as I said earlier, takes a first step. And and so this morning, I have a first step. And it may be for you, it may be that you want to take this for somebody else. But here on the stage and in the back of the room, I have uh, some prayers on a green sheet of paper. That's just an Advent prayer to receive Christ. And it's based on today's message uh, where we just simply come to God and say, I don't want to walk in darkness anymore. And so you may want to take that and keep it with you. And maybe you could give that to somebody or, or pray over that with somebody. But every journey with Christ begins with a first step. This can be a first step for somebody. And so I encourage you uh, to pick that up and uh, uh, make use of that. Now, last thing before we share communion together is I want you to know that we also are called to reflect the light. Jesus said, now you are the light of the world. Now that he's come to shatter the darkness, now he wants the light to shine through you. And so he says, you're the light of the world. Let your light shine. Friends, could it be that sometimes people out there don't know the hope for the holidays because the light hasn't shone through us? And can we make it our goal that here during this Advent season, we're going to let our light shine? And can you make it your goal that you'll invite at least one other person to come to a Christmas Eve candlelight service where they can hear hope that goes far beyond Christmas? Can we reflect the light of Christ Friends, there's no greater hope than Jesus coming to shatter the darkness.